Hello and welcome to our first webinar series for the NJCU EdTech 2021 Spring Webinar Series for the Department of Educational Technology and Leadership. I am Samantha Bonna. I'm the grad assistant for the Department of Educational Technology Leadership, and we're excited to kick off a very compelling session with Cohort 7 member Dana Mason. Uh, he'll be presenting on integrating innovation and developing STEAM resources for all educators. And so I'm excited to turn this over to Dana so she can get started with the presentation. And if you are uh, following along with us today and you're joining us um, in the live session, please don't hesitate to ask questions of Dana by dropping your questions in the chat. Uh, we'll let Dana know that you have the questions so that way um, we can have them answered for you. And if you're watching us asynchronously, Dana's provided her contact information here so that you can then contact Dana at any point uh, that if you have further questions for her, or if you'd like to reach us out to us, you can do so at njcu.edu forward slash edtech or edtech at njcu.edu. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dana Mason to introduce herself a little bit further. Hi everybody. I am so glad that you could come and spend today with us and you could join us in this session. Um, my, I am a uh, technology teacher at um, Henry E. Harris School in Bayonne, New Jersey. And um, my initial background, though, is that I come from the arts, and I've been a music teacher for about 10 years prior to that, uh, teaching pretty much everything from high school band to elementary strings and general music. Uh, it's, been, it's been a really cool experience because as I started to develop in that area and start to learn more about technology, I signed up through the um, to finish my master's through ed tech at NJCU and a whole new world opened up to me where I started learning more about um, STEAM education. And today I'm very excited to be able to share with you some of the things I've learned through my research, some of my experience and um, be able to pass along things that may help as you continue to develop your bag of tricks for STEAM education and implementing it kind of across various um, subject matters because STEAM could be everywhere. It doesn't just have to be in one lab. So um, I just want to start out, um, feel free if you'd like. Um, I have a small um, community that we're developing uh, called the Digital Innovation Station on Facebook. A friend of mine and I work with it together and we post some professional development opportunities and people like to share things that they're working on. So if you'd like to get um, involved with a very supportive group of people who love to celebrate anything STEAM, feel free to find us on Facebook. And um, you can also ask questions if anything comes up after our session to my email address, danamason18 at gmail.com. And um, just because I really like to try to evaluate and make sure that what I'm offering when I'm offering a presentation is of something of substance and it's exactly what people are asking for. Um, at the end, I'll also have this link again, um, if you'd be able to fill it out at the end of the session, just a quick like, 30 second survey, so I have an idea of what other topics people are interested in. Um, so without further ado, we're gonna get started. And um, I figured we'd start out talking about what STEAM is, because most people are very well aware of what STEM is, because STEM is, is a, a form of like learning where it co um, combines science, technology, engineering, and math. And this has been pretty popular since the late 70s all the way through the end of the 20th century. And um, people were um, in education have been kind of shifting the way that they're modeling teaching these because they find that there's a convergence in this sort of convergent, convergent learning where all these subjects are supportive of one another and can be taught simultaneously. While that was happening, they were um, of course finding that this was a wonderful thing, but um, there was a, a lack of divergent thinking that was brought to the table because a lot of the people that are traditionally trained in science, technology, engineering, and math um, are come from a very co convergent world of thinking. So it's two plus two is four. It's always going to be four. There is one right answer and that's what we're looking for. And so sometimes in a collaborative session, things look a little differently working from that arena. But now when we added something uh, like arts and design to it to create STEAM, it added now that extra area of um, divergent learning, which is where we, we start to kind of circle around. We brainstorm, we throw ideas out. And sometimes there's, there's multiple solutions to the same problem. And we have to pick for maybe efficiency reasons or cost-effective reasons or just what looks better with design. There are many solutions to whatever the problem at hand is. So 
by integrating arts, that's become the new 21st century um, push with um, STEM education by making it into the modern STEAM education. And so um, as we move forward through STEAM education, it also helps us um, just add an extra layer while we are reinforcing 21st century skills, collaboration, interpersonal skills, uh, creativity, and um, just getting people to think and design in different ways by relying on those very important science, technology, engineering, and math skills really helps us come up with incredible innovations for the modern times. And that's really something amazing. Uh, America's always had a great, um, I would say, reputation in the sense that we're, we've been great designers. We've come up with a lot of innovative uh, things that have helped our world. And so um, when working in this area, you can see why, because it's kind of been part of our um, heritage of the past few decades, because uh, our education system has been focusing on that and completing how they, um, I guess you'd say like hone it into even a, a better well-oiled machine. So um, one of the things that's something that uh, we should always consider is this quote. And um, when I went to the teachers convention um, in 2010, uh, Sir Kenneth Robinson was our guest speaker and uh, the keynote actually. And his speech was, or a quote from it, how do we educate our children to take place in the economies of the 21st century, given that we can't anticipate what the economy will look like next week? And as that sunk in, I really, it blew my mind. And I'm thinking, yeah, how many people studied what they studied in you know, high school, college, trade school, whatever their, their job training was, and how it's become very different these days. And where many of us have been able to rely on those formal educations and trainings that we've received in our current time, it's not going to be the same come 20 years from now. So what we're teaching our children and what we are developing them with as they become young adults and productive members of the workforce, we can't just teach them a static skill that, that is just a static skill. We have to be able to teach them how to adapt and evolve and how to teach themselves and creative problem solving. And that's where STEAM comes in. So our shift can't just be facts and this is how you do it. Because even if we taught them how to use modern computer this way for this particular machinery, that's going to evolve probably 10 more times by the time they enter the workforce. And there'll be new procedures and new processes as we continue to um, make things more efficient. And uh, that is something we need to take into consideration. So 21st century skills, I have a little wordle here. This is something that I always like because these are things that, that um, people call them soft skills a lot of times uh, where that's kind of incorporated into the idea of 21st century skills. And um, honestly, the soft skills are what give us our muscle moving forward into the 21st century. Creativity um, to work and be flexible with what we're learning and, and really collaborate with other individuals, honoring everybody else's specialties at the same time, bringing that together to create a common goal and solution is really something very, very important. So we have to make sure that we are equipping our students with that. And in so doing, we also need to make sure that we are instilling that in ourselves and that we're living up to what we're preaching. Because as teachers doing the same routine year after year, it can be difficult to start reaching out for new things and finding ways to stretch and grow. So through STEAM education, through the adventure of what 21st century skills provides us, I think we as teachers also continue to reach out. And that's why you guys are here today tuning into this, because you're learning more, you're broadening your, your horizons, and, and many of us are in different areas where we're fascinated to learn and grow. And that's exactly what one of the uh, major components, I think, of 21st century learning is. So we have to support each other and pass that on as we continue. So um, many people think that a makerspace or a STEAM lab has to be one particular place. Um, it also has to be a very specific place. <laughs> uh, I'm showing you a picture of my old classroom um, because this is currently um, <laughs> the ridiculous mess that I have <laughs> that we had working. Um, most of these are boxes with student, um, student projects in it that they were letting dry and they were kind of stacking so we could reuse the space for other classes during the day. Um, and as I said, I teach technology and, and a big component of that is not just computer programming and uh, playing games and other things like that, but it's, it's also getting kids to work collaboratively and integrate STEAM and these wonderful 21st century skills into their um, scholastic experience. So this obviously looks like a mess, <laughs> but it's what we had to work with. Um, there wasn't a lot of extra funding at the time to go around and take care of all these different things. And so I was in a position where I knew all these beautiful, fantastic ideas had to be um, inspired and, and really exposed for these children to be exposed to. And I felt like 
I was coming back to this big pile in the middle of the room where we were just existing around each other and, and moving things from here to there. And it was just a chaotic mess. So I decided that I wanted to really try to get some sort of organization. And um, I also wanted to be able to share what we were doing and have other teachers bring that into other groups and other uh, classrooms so that it wasn't something that was just all happening in my four walls, but could also exist within the four walls of the entire school, even if it's just a little bit here and there that they sprinkle it in. And so um, I started coming up with new ideas. I started um, sharing things with other teachers and partnering with people who were open-minded to change or just kind of wanted to try something new. And um, little by little, I started getting a lot of support from the school. I learned about grants. I learned about how to organize my space more efficiently. And um, my space, oops, my space became like this. And uh, this is still a work in progress, but certainly moving forward. And so um, I, now I have tables. That was the biggest, uh, biggest change. And one of the things I was very, very grateful for was that in um, all the changes that had happened, we actually got to paint the walls a different color. So this room is one of the first rooms that doesn't have the traditional beige on all the walls. And I, it's such a, a breath of fresh air when you walk into it, because that's what I wanted people to feel. And I was excited to be able to have that happen. So kids came in, I think for the first half of the year in this new space, and they were so excited and just taken back with how different things looked and how we were able to um, kind of reorganize and, and make things more efficient and some of the new materials they had. But it, it came after a lot of work and a lot of partnering with people around me. So as we continue going forward, um, not everyone has a lot of budget within their school. I know I did not. And that's not to any fault of anyone. It's just how things are. And sometimes as we're trying to do um, implement new programs, it's the stigma that, okay, you're implementing a new program at a school, it's gonna cost us thousands of dollars and we have to find the funding. We have to find some way to make this all happen. Um, what, implementing STEAM into your classrooms or starting your own STEAM lab is probably one of the easiest things to begin and establish because there are so many uh, materials that are just, either you already have them, you can repurpose them, they can be upcycled. Um, I've made some different lists here and I'm actually gonna go from right to left on this one. You have building supplies that are, are all, you can see these little asterisks I put next to them. These are um, upcycled things. So for most of these materials, as you're looking through this list, um, and I can definitely share this presentation with anyone who's interested. So that's not a problem. Um, just send me a message and I can, I can take care of that for you later. So I know it's a lot to absorb with this kind of a list all at once. But these, um, the asterisk stands for things that can be upcycled. So many parents, I mean, how many people have string laying in a drawer somewhere that they're just not using or yarn? How many people are, are knitters or, or especially after this um, time of the shutdown, many people have been learning new hobbies. So, I mean, if you have a ball of yarn that's mostly used, there's a little leftover, we could use it at the school. Um, same thing with paper towel rolls and, and bottle caps and all kinds of things. You can set up a, um, a letter. And of course, I would always recommend before you reach out to parents asking for donations or anything, uh, get it approved by your building principal just to make sure everyone's aware of what you're doing and that you're not violating any policies that, that you're maybe not aware of. In doing really good and really having enthusiasm, it's easy to maybe make a mistake here or there just because of something that's new and you're not quite aware of. Um, so you can reach out and you can uh, construct a letter and see if they'd be okay with uh, parents donating things. And kids can just, instead of throwing away their paper towel rolls, they can bring them into your classroom. Same thing with old tissue paper or bubble wrap. How many Amazon boxes are we all swimming in? <laughs> so you can oftentimes recycle those types of things within your classroom and use it as building supplies, creativity supplies for when you're designing new projects with students. And then of course, there's this, uh, the list over on the, the left, the uh, steam toys, the equipment. And I put them as high ticket items because you may have these already, um, but some of them, they cost a little bit. They're actually things you'd buy, like um, Raspberry Pi, if you're doing some sort of uh, circuitry and, and you're doing programming. You could also use hot glue gun, hot glue sticks, um, rechargeable batteries, dice, cards. Um, they're not even that expensive. Most of them, you can get them at a discount, but um, it is something that even like sets of Legos or connects, those are types of things that you'd have to purchase or maybe would, um, be, get through a grant. Now, um, something else to remember as you're going through this too is stuff like Legos and Connects. Many people invest in these for their, their children and will have sets upon sets upon sets. And they all end up in one big bin and then eventually the kids grow up and you know you don't use them as much at home. So you can put an, a little sticker out there or an email if it's okay with your building uh, administration that uh, anyone has leftover connects or leftover Legos that you can actually donate them and make a huge supply of them in your classroom. 
And so that really helps a lot too, because they're completely renewable and um, they're easy enough to sterilize, especially when we're back to in learning person, in, uh, in person learning. <laughs> so um, that's pretty good too. Um, and then some people really want to help. You'll find that there are some parents who maybe don't have a lot of these or really don't want to have time, take time to like uh, build up a bag of bottle caps or something or ping pong balls. So maybe they'd prefer to do something like an Amazon gift card or a Home Depot or Lowe's gift card. So we can get a lot of those types of materials here um, and kind of fill in the gaps with whatever you've been donated. Always though, like I said, check with your building administration because everyone has different um, rules about how purchases need to be made through the school. And you wanna make sure that um, how donations are being handled and things like that. But um, usually parents are more than happy to get these off their off their back and, oh great, I have a place where someone can use the Legos, the, the thousands and thousands of them that we have. So that's always a good thing. But um, just be creative. And uh, most of these you can bin up or put in a bag and they store very easily. So um, you can also just do donations if you're maybe not a STEAM lab, but you're integrating it in your classroom, you may be fo um, just focusing on one particular lesson that you're doing, and that's going to require uh, old cereal boxes or copy paper or something, and people can bring in different things like that just for that, that particular assignment. So you don't have, you know, bags and bags of all these found materials everywhere. <laughs> okay. So another thing that I really love about the STEAM integration process is that um, it allows us to integrate the problem solving process and the engineering design process. So um, this is wonderful and kids can take this lesson with them and, or this what they're learning with these particular models in anything that they're working on, just you can apply it to anything. So <laughs> we'll talk about examples as we go through, but what I love about this is, let's start with my favorite, the problem solving process. This image is actually from code.org. And when I've done training with them, this is beautiful because it's a nice, simple model. Um, this is based on George Poyla's four-step process as problem solving and which, or solving problems, I should say. And that was um, from the 1940s. And um, what I think is great about this one particularly is that it starts out simple you define the problem and there are steps to help you with that. So what are your constraints? What are you trying to solve? What does success look like? So you kind of have a general idea of what you're, what you're going to be working on so that you're not taking shots in the dark. The next one is to prepare. So you're going to brainstorm with your collaborative team. You may have partners in this or your students may have them. If they're working at a table with people, you know, it, they don't have to be sitting independently at desks. Um, right now, I know with the in-person and returning to school, we're learning to overcome challenges with um, working in close proximity, but this is not going to last forever. So while we're still battling these um, COVID restrictions, we can also start uh, building our bag of tricks on how we can do this and formulate things for when it is safer to be back to a more normal process. Um, along the way, you can compare pros and cons while you're preparing to solve this problem. And you basically the team would make a plan. So they would go from defining to preparing and their plan would be then to construct whatever they're working on and then give it a try. So put the plan into action. This could be to build something or create a prototype. It could also be to maybe redesign a new system of process. Um, for example, let's say kids are going down to lunch and for some reason the lines are so long, they're not able to all get to finish their lunch in the allotted time and clean up and get ready to go back and it's a very rushed situation and kids are staying longer. So if that would, let's say that became a problem, if that was something they were charged with, they would have to come up with a new process of operation for, okay, maybe have different classes go at the same time. Let's have stagger lunch uh, by 15 minutes per grade level or something like that based on the grades that are there. They could come up with maybe line varieties for kids who are, are getting different types of uh, things from the lunch tables, maybe putting up new stations so that it's not just all one place. Based on what they're given, they can now come up with either a process or an actual prototype. And then reflecting. Did it work? Did it not work? Did you reach your goals? What could be better? Now, the beauty of this is that as it goes forward this way, all of our process can also go backward, which is why I like the interior cycle circle going on. The arrows will go in the opposite direction because sometimes you're defining your process and as you're preparing to solve that problem, you may have to go back to defining it because maybe you realized, oh, I missed something. I didn't quite get it. So kids are constantly going to be doing a dance between define, prepare, define, prepare. Maybe it's going to be prepare, try, prepare, try. Then maybe it'll be prepare, try. And then by the time they're reflecting, it already goes back to re-preparing. 
So this kind of process really moves in both directions and almost simultaneously as they're going through it. And that's what I really love because um, you know, a mistake is just another opportunity to learn how to do it better. And so there's never really a wrong answer. There's just, okay, this is a solution. Maybe we can come up with a better one. And that really reinforces that for students and helps take away the fear of failure because so many are in that convergent thinking like, okay, but I didn't get the right answer. I, I didn't, I didn't do it right. It didn't work. That's okay. We start, we start again, or we go back and we find what was wrong. We fix the bugs. The engineering design process is also great because this one I like to use with my middle school students or I would suggest it for high school students. Um, also because it's very similar, similar to this, but it adds a little more definition to extra steps, but essentially kind of works in the same way. The, the first five steps continue to cycle until you can, um, if, you, if it works and you present your solutions, you're great. So um, you identify the problem here at the top, research and brainstorm, very much like preparing. Uh, then you build and test, which is kind of the try. And then if it works, great, you present, you're done. <laughs> if not, which in many cases you may have to improve. So you go to the improve step and you work on that and you redefine and you work through that same cycle again. So they're both very similar, but uh, a little more detailed. And um, there's also different engineering design processes. You'll find different uh, ones with more breakdown, more steps. Um, there's one that talks about ideating and really breaking open what that means. Um, sometimes less is more, in my opinion, especially when you're introducing this to students for the first time. If there are way too many steps, some kids kind of zone out and they just glaze. They don't really buy into it. But a simple has been working great for a lot of the grade levels I work with. So I do appreciate this first one as a nice introduction. And a lot of times too, in the classroom, um, we have a lot of different things that we're faced with. So um, space is an issue, budget can be an issue. And so in case you are still just developing or you don't have you're like your, your bag of tricks here, or you are maybe looking for space to start creating things, you can start this creative thinking and this design thinking through STEAM education by with very, very simple, minimal things. If you have a couple of index cards and some, some sticky dots and uh, maybe a little construction paper or cardstock, there are plenty of things you can do. So these are just some basic examples to get you started. Um, one of these, the three dot icebreaker is one of my favorites. Um, these obviously don't have three dots, the ones on the bottom right, but at the top right, you can see, you prepare cards with three different dots, put them down in random locations. You could use it as an icebreaker, you could just use it as, a, as an activity. And um, what you do is give one to everybody, each person gets a different card. So it's a different configuration of dots and colors. And then they just create a picture out of it which is kind of like what the bottom picture looks like. And you'd be surprised what students come up with. See if they can come up with something that relates back to a book you're reading or maybe a chapter you're working on in science or something like that. And just getting them to think about that helps them to basically start solving problems and starting to think collaboratively if they're working in groups. It's a very simple thing, but it really does offer a lot of um, educational value. Another one, the center, um, uh, the center one that I have at the top, the paper column testing. Uh, very simple. You can use different paper with different um, thicknesses. So you could use something like origami paper, which is maybe a little thinner at times, construction paper, copy paper, cardstock, and um, make sure everybody has the same thing and, and have them work with different structures and shapes, and they can start working on uh, what's most weight bearing. And the testing it is always the funnest part because all the kids will come up with something and they want to design these really cool towers and then you'll put a book maybe you'll put a few books and you see who can who can have as many books on top of theirs and they get really excited especially when one falls apart it is kind of fun hearing the crash of books <laughs> and it's only you know eight inches wide so it's not like you're dropping things from the top of the ceiling but it's always a lot of fun um, another thing too could be the paper chain activity this is my personal favorite in groups i've done this in um, larger um, like um, professional developments as, and everybody who's sitting in a group gets one sheet of paper. I like to give them all different colors. So each chain becomes a different color. And um, what they have to do is try to make the longest chain and the strongest one. And um, everybody comes up with a different idea of how they're gonna do it. Sometimes they're cutting small slivers like the one all the way on the right, but they don't always hold up. And um, you only give them one thing like a little bit of tape or like six inches of tape to try to make it work. So there's a lot of different constraints based on what they're trying to work with. So these all kind of get you thinking and working together. And uh, I really like that too, because it, it starts to move your, um, your, your shift your, your ideas. And as a student too, these feel more like games, which is kind of fun. They're, they're collaborative, fun activities, instead of just having to kind of 
sit down and all right, now I have to be quiet and solitary, especially after when we start going back to school, there will be fun things and this will help with that socialization too. Even if we're collaborating with a bit of a distance for safety, that still will allow us the, the interaction. And that's something that we all have to kind of relearn. So that's something to remember. Another group activity that I love, um, tag, you're an engineer. <laughs> and uh, we need to create name tags for each person in your group that can be seen from across the room. Okay, so there, what you'll do is um, you can give each group a piece of paper and the directions of the challenge are to follow the directions on your page given to your group and create tags from the colored paper. Remember, you can have no scraps from the paper. You must have different shapes and one of the shapes has to be a circle and you can't stick it on your body. You have to either have it folded or find a way to stick it to your, keep it on yourself where it'll stay on when you're moving around. That's fun when you have classes that are getting to know each other because you know you can actually have them parade across and see if you can read everybody, see if they're, do they have all the right shapes? How did they make the tags stay on? So it, there's really great stuff and there's collaboration that happens even beyond the small group when you, if you open it up to the whole group for critique and discussion. So that's always a fun, simple thing too. And it's just cost you maybe five or six pieces of paper total. Uh, there are other ones too that are simple. Um, I did a lot of training with, um, there was a Honeywell teacher in space opportunity. And um, I got to go to Huntsville, Alabama to study with NASA and have a space camp experience, which I loved. And um, so there's a lot of bags, things in my bags of tricks that have steam and NASA and space all over it. So this is a great one too, where um, you can see on the right, there's a, a at the bottom is actually the um, web address if you'd like to download this yourself. But um, it's a rocket activity. It discusses the SLS space launch system, which is gonna be the most powerful rocket and it's going to help us get to Mars, which is exciting. So uh, what we've learned from this is that um, how rockets work and you can actually um, do put a straw in it and have the, use the, um, the sheet in the back and tape it around the straw, find a way to, um, to adhesive or close off the tip. And then you can have the kids blow through their straws and see which rocket goes as far as it can. And they can make small modifications too to see, all right, did that help? Did it not help? And uh, that's always a good thing. Sometimes we line them all up across one room and everybody just blows their rockets at the same time through the straw. And we see, <laughs> everyone puts their initials and we go look for the winners that are further away. It's a lot of fun in the group, but it really just a couple of simple materials. The, um, another thing that I think is great too, because in other classrooms too, uh, you might be teaching science, you might be teaching social studies or language arts or math. And um, there's a great thing called NASA Eclipse. And um, this is a great way to get the whole class doing some active learning. NASA Eclipse allows you to, um, these are all different videos done for grades three to five, six to eight, nine to 12. You can see different groups. And then there's student product produced videos. And um, what's great about these is that um, they will take something simple, uh, just a small concept, like maybe it's phases of the moon or Saturn's rings. And then what they'll have is people explaining it and breaking it down to a quick uh, instructional video. What I love about the student productions is that you can get really creative with this and have your students get involved by creating their own um, videos. So you can use this. You don't have to do space stuff. It could be literally anything from how to cook macaroni and cheese or, um, you know, explaining something in a book, do like a book review. <laughs> I uh, always wanted to do some sort of like um, ca book cafe club kind of thing where, you know, they, they talk about it and then they can interview and go back and forth or even have students create their own books and uh, stories that they're reading and have someone interview them too and talk about what the impact was and kind of inter do the author interview student to student. There are so many instrument like so many options you have here and I get really excited about it because when you see what the kids come up with it really gets exciting um so you can first easy stuff is have have them teams that you put kids in maybe two or three or more have them agree on a topic what are they going to teach what are they going to present um may, you can base it on your curriculum or what's working what you're working on that week um or a novel that you're reading um, allow time for kids to do their research and collaborate then have them discuss planning and storyboarding how are, what are they going to teach? How are they going to put it out there? What are they going to do? What's the setting going to be like? Have them go through all of that. Uh, the students then create a script. And then the last step, they can rehearse and finally film it. And you can then edit and share it, which is great too, because on your class website or for the school, people can start learning about things and seeing um, 
the cool stuff that your kids are doing. And maybe other kids and other classes will learn from that. If it's something that is from a, a lower grade, maybe they'll pick something that another class is working on so they can help share a little knowledge from their perspective. And um, you don't have to have an expert degree or anything or even experience before in any sort of um, uh, like video or filming or whatever. Everything can be learned very easily and quickly online. And from this small idea, you can go in any direction with it. It really breaks the door down for a lot of other possibilities. Um, just up above at the top here, WeVideo, Flipgrid, Adobe Spark, Loom, and Screencastify. These are just some uh, suggestions of free um, free platforms you could use for creating the videos. If you have a tablet or just something small that you can use uh, to, to or even a cell phone, whatever you have, you can film. Uh, some schools have a video camera and that's great too. And if you really want, down below I have links under the resources for video production. Each of those are the links. There's also a green screen tutorial that I incorporated because sometimes what you can do is a uh, green screens are really easy to do. You could put a really bright green plastic tablecloth up, <laughs> have that work um, and just create your own cheapy green screen if you could tape it to the wall. Sometimes you could set up a whole studio and that's fine too. But um, if you, when you're working with that, that tutorial will show you, maybe you want to drop some animation behind. So you're filming people in the front and doing some other things in the back. It really gets kids thinking. And again, you don't have to be an expert at it, but having those, um, those tools for the kids to learn and get involved in, they'll be able to start kind of learning on their own, which allows them to start working on autonomous learning and take some sort of ownership and choice into consideration when they're being able to do their projects. Um, another thing is to utilize technology tools here. You can also use drones. Drones are very, very inexpensive. Um, there are some you can get for about 20 bucks. Um, under $50, you can get a lot. Uh, there's a five gram drone that's pretty uh, universal and you could use them in the school building. The uh, good thing about drones is that you are preparing students for the future. You can do different things with, uh, with computer programming and um, you can help kids figure out something for the future. There are a lot of um, people that are, have, have drone licenses and will actually be able to pilot drones for a variety of different things. There's uh, logistics and distribution, but you can also think about people who are maybe monitoring how bridge construction is happening. Not everybody can climb up to an unfinished bridge, but we can fly a drone and attach a camera and really get a great idea of what's happening. So there are many, many different ways that drones could be used in the real world. And there's some great activities that you can do with this. Uh, Tinker has drone activities, which I attached a link to at the bottom here, because you can do that for free. And it's a lot of fun. Um, I had a coworker who was absolutely brilliant and he did um, drones with kids at a tic-tac-toe game where they had to worry about, uh, try to get the drone and, and fly it over to wherever they wanted it on the tic-tac-toe board and land the drone safely. And when the when it landed, they either got an X or an O depending on their team and they had to try to get it onto the board and, and win the game. So that was a lot of fun too. I know the kids just love that. So now we're starting to talk about uh, computer programming. And one thing that I keep in mind with computer programming is that um, I, I was, I came from the world of music. I knew nothing about this. And when I say nothing, I mean nothing. <laughs> and in a short time, you start to understand the logic behind it and you start picking up things and you, you just start learning along with the kids. And before you know it, you have a different comfort level when it comes to this. So you can do Girls Who Code with groups of kids that seem to be interested in this. One thing I love about Girls Who Code is that it is a wonderful group. Um, it's just for girls mostly. And it's, it's a wonderful opportunity for um, girls to start finding out more about how they can make an impact in technology. The, back in the day, I think like the 20s and 30s, when the first programmers came out, they were women. And for all the way through the 60s, they were, it was primarily a female dominated role, which blows my mind. I love that because now growing up in the 21st century and the 20th century, the end of, I always thought it was a male dominated role. And guys have been doing such a great job with innovation. Let me tell you, it's been fantastic. But we're represented in our innovation and with only 50% of the population. Just think, imagine if we had more female programmers these days, as opposed to when we did when it first started, um, it just totally would, would open up what we're able to offer because we're offering the rest of the population to give um, another consideration for design, for problem solving. And um, there are statistics, uh, Girl Scouts of America has some great statistics on gender roles and um, gender in um, programming and, and just STEM in general, which is STEAM, which is great. Um, so a lot of girls find their interest in programming and computers because they're interested in social problems and they're interested in larger real world problems. So 
having those two mentalities from, from both parts of the society is really uh, beneficial, I think. So uh, you don't have to have any experience. It is a completely great tutorial that will take the kids through it and you just work with them and show them what's available to them. And they learn about other women in the field who are doing great things in with coding and bridging maybe their love of dance and computer programming. It's fantastic. So definitely free and totally open. Um, utilizing technology tools like Code Forward. This is something that uh, was a free online program for free online programming lessons for students through Facebook. And they actually, I'm not sure if they still have it, but it's worth checking out. Um, it may have been a little different with the shutdown. They may have changed what they were offering. But um, I earned this, I wrote a grant and I earned this um, bolt pack of Spiros. There's a whole bunch of them. And really, it, it makes my life so much easier. There's 15, they charge all together, they're securely packed, and um, the whole case charges for them. They have the skins that comes with it, and some tape for the floor so you can do all kinds of things. If you've never used Spiros before, Spiros, uh, if you go to their activities for every subject, I have the link in the center of the page. That is fantastic because they literally have um, designed lessons for everything, arts, language arts, um, technology, science, social studies, uh, world cultures, everything you can imagine. And they come up with the creative, the most creative ways to use these. So definitely look into that if you're looking to get these into your classroom. Kids love them and they have so much fun and it's basic programming that they're practicing at the same time. Um, another thing too is many of these are, are lessons on Sphero are, are uh, thought of and devised, uh, de excuse me, designed by uh, people from around the world. So some of them are in different languages. Many of them actually are. It's not just all English. So if you have English language learners, these lessons will be perfect because you can find something. Um, a lot of times it's similar lessons written in multiple languages with just slight differences. So you can have everybody pay attention and participate. Another free one is Scratch and App Inventor. Inventor. Scratch is just a great platform um, where you can have kids learning how to use code blocks. Um, you can give them little programs. They can design scenes and cartoons and all kinds of great things. And you also use it with uh, Girls Who Code. They also, um, MIT App Inventor was created as well. And I love this one. You can see a friend of mine and I went to this PD and these are some of the pictures from what we created. The, um, they now support um, Apple devices as well as Android. So when you create an app and you do the programming for it, uh, we created a drawing one where you could upload a picture and draw little things over it. We also created one that was like a Pong game and it actually will produce it and put it in the app store. So you just uh, search for the name and you could download it to your own phone and have your the students and their parents can download it. And it's great because they'll say, oh, look what I did in class today. So you can do that with different themes and integrate that with different subject matter. If you are working with kids and, and you have kids that respond to gamification, Codable is one of the most wonderful free resources you can get. Now, of course, they do have paid subscriptions, which offer many, many more mazes, but it breaks down the idea of thinking in terms of algorithm and following directions through um, this particular platform. So you get this little uh, cute fuzz and you earn coins when you get all the stars and you go through different things and you have to use arrows to direct them through all of the mazes. And it touches on loops and conditions and sequence and so many different elements that um, kids start picking up naturally that when they start using code blocks later and programming with language, they start really understanding what they were learning when they were younger. So um, you can use this, I believe, up to grade five. There are different levels, um, but I've used it. Um, they have kindergarten stuff and you can really get kids started with the freebies. So check out Codable as well if you're looking for a new resource. And um, code.org, I still have to say, is one of my favorite online um, programs to use for computer programming. There are courses for pre-readers so that you can, there are express courses for kids that you don't see very often. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, CS Fundamentals would be for the younger guys. CS Discoveries is, uh, they start doing CSS, HTML, and actually programming with languages. So kids with a little more experience, they uh, recommend from six through nine. And CS Principles is gonna be more uh, like working with uh, Python and they have great, great lessons that teach kids step-by-step -step how to go through all of this. And again, you don't have to have this experience, but you can learn alongside your students. Um, what I think is most important about remembering when we are talking about computer programming is that when we, when we started with this, um, you think that, oh, well, I'm just going to be a programmer. And if I don't have that kind of brain, if I don't know how to think that way, or I don't enjoy it or whatever, I don't want to be a programmer, or whatever. You know, that's kind of like some of the resistance I got in the beginning. And when we started talking about um, what the purpose was behind computer programming, they're talking about people losing jobs all the time. Let's just take EasyPass in our state. Now, 
it was tragic because I knew people who were working for the, that were toll collectors that did lose their jobs and it was sad um, or their jobs were reduced and things had changed. But for each person that was also not able to work in that physical, you know, counting the money and doing things back and forth and collecting the tolls, they now have programmers and people who are maintaining and doing things virtually and digitally with this type of stuff. And if you don't have these electronic skills, uh, when a job goes uh, changes from becoming manual and becomes electronic or automated in some sort of way, it's not that people are losing their jobs, but the skills to do the job has now changed. And that was a big shift. I think people started to understand when we were start when we began this in class. Um, as long as you have these other skills and you're learning more modern skills, you will always have an opportunity to utilize it later and and integrate it with your work. And you'll be able to get better wages as time goes on. And it'll actually help with innovation and design as we go on, because you just never know. You start with it now, you have no idea where it's gonna take you. It just opens up amazing doors for the future. So these are really great. There's a lot of different things. And I urge you to really check that out on your own time if you can. And um, one of the things we did with code.org, we used something called Makey Makey, which is a basic circuitry. And we used some basic materials and our, my kids created their own video game one year. So I'm just gonna take a second to play this for you. Whoops, sorry. Ah, there we go. Oh no, there we go. Oh no. <laughs> I think we're good now. Let me see if I can get this to play. Great. Hello, everyone. This is Henry E. Maris Community School in Bayonne, New Jersey. And today we're going to be talking about how we built our video game. The theme of the game was circuits and Coding and everyone in the group is Isaac, Sam, Peyton, Lily, Joseph, and Eddie. And now Lily will be talking to us about the design of the game. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our video game, HH Touchdown. So, as you can see, we used cardboard and uh, paper to cover the whole box. We also painted it green because it's part of the art of the field. So, as you can see, we have the word down. We painted a uh, touchdown in yellow, just like the goalposts. And then if we turn it around, we have our yard lines. And we also have our school mascot, the hawk, who is also our football mascot. And then we'll do a finish tag. We have touch, and now we have this. This is our controller for our video game. Uh, we use the football design because it matches the theme of our controller, and it's a cool design. So for our controller, we have our circuits here. This is um, what's underneath our circuits, our first circuit for our controller here. We have our alligator clips, which are connected to the um, little pieces of tin foil. We use little pieces of tin foil because they're great conductors of electricity. So it'll complete all the circuits. So this is basically what's underneath the controller. And for our regular controller here, we just put another piece of uh, cardboard over it to make the side of the football. And then we paint, we paint it a little bit. And then for our circuits here, when you're holding the controller, you just have to make contact with the sides and it grounds all the circuits together and then you can work the video. Now Joseph works the so We basically use code.org to um, program the game. Every step that you see here, from the ball going out to a going on the sides to the field goal, that's all that we program. Uh, Eddie here is going to show you how to play the game. So basically the objective of the game is to get the ball in the field goal and you score points. And you try to score more points to the computer. If the ball gets out, then the computer gets a point. So we pro as you can see here, we program everything, uh, the sounds, the foot moves, and then here it's showing you how to play. So uh, we have the shape of the football. We picked it because it makes it more complicated for you to play with it instead of like a soccer ball or a puck or a baseball. We conducted a survey for our beta testing and we surveyed various teachers um, on a scale from one to five being five the least, not being one the least and five the best. We asked them how the comfort of the controller was, how the comfort of the game console was, the controller reaction time, the visibility of the game, and clear directions on playing the game. We got positive and negative feedback, but it helped us um, change the game and make it better so it would fit everybody's liking. So our objective 
of this was just to use basic materials to make this video. Some of the materials that we used were cardboard boxes, a mouse, a making make piece, and some paint. We put them all together and made this video for you guys to try. I hope you have a fun time doing this video game with your teachers at school. And this was our project in the week. So um, I always enjoyed working with that group. Uh, you could tell that there was uh, one of the girls was um, very, very artistic and she was our art expert and helped a lot with the design. And some of the other kids were great at all the other things too, like the science behind it. And one kid was a programming whiz. So we were able to make it really creative, but it allowed the kids to actually create um, the controller. And that was a cool experience for them. They really enjoyed that. So it felt like they really made a video game. We, we tested it with teachers and students. We did it at a PTA meeting and really wanted to give good PR because um, they had won uh, for the RJW Barnabas STEM competition. They were, um, they won third place. They won second in the county and then also uh, went on to win the steam tank competition. And unfortunately now with the pandemic, <laughs> we weren't able to go to Atlantic City this past um, November like we wanted to, but that's another opportunity too for kids who are creating things. These are some other things that you can check out um, for different apps, different, um, St things to study and just stuff to review. It's not something to actually read through right this second, but I did put it in our presentation so you can use your own, you know, make it into your own checklist as time goes on to help you with things to consider so that you can customize your space and your purpose with STEAM. And um, whoops, there are some extra resources here as well. Um, there are plenty of things that um, help with sustainability like the Future City Competition, uh, STEAM Tank Competition, and um, many other things too. There's something called Civil Air Patrol where you can, um, you, the link is there for it. It's a $35 teacher membership, but you can apply every month for a different uh, um, a grant for a mini STEM kit. And I've gotten so many great resources uh, shipped up from them. They just ask that you show it being used and that you just give a review of it afterwards. And every year they have some different things. So those are some favorite things that I didn't get a chance to really talk about today that I think you'd benefit from. So please do check out some of these resources and see if you could add them to your quiver. And um, I really thank you guys all for being here today. And um, I just, I'm so happy to be able to share. So if there is something that you liked, something that you wish you would have learned more about, or you'd like to know more about, please fill out the survey. I have it at the bottom left of the screen. And uh, that would really be great because I'll be able to um, stay in contact with you if you like. You can stay, uh, join our collaborative space on Facebook, the in Digital Innovation Station. And um, feel free to reach out to me with questions or anything. Sometimes it's hard when you're processing things to come up with questions, but there's always time in the future. So always drop me a line. It was great presenting and being with you today. Um, are there any questions that come up? Okay, Dana. So we do have some questions for you in the chat. And great. one of the questions was uh, with your three dot icebreakers, um, would that be an acceptable activity to use with students that are pre K? pre-K through K-3, um, and if so, uh, where can you also then uh, provide a link to find the uh, straw robot race? Oh, great. So um, really, really good question. So the first thing is absolutely with the three dot card, it's kind of a blank slate in the sense that you can use it with any age level. I've used it with adults to um, just be an icebreaker for a professional development and everyone starts sharing and, you know, just kind of melts the ice literally. <laughs> um, with little kids though, what I notice is they have such an interesting eye and perception they see things differently than we do probably because of, of where they are in life and they're, literally their size because they're they're on a different plane than the rest of us as adults and um the things they come up with are great and many of them you'll see different things from their storybooks um i know why put green and red dots on one and a kid came up with hungry hungry caterpillar which blew my mind i was like that is so smart um and then i started thinking about linking that to different books and things that they were reading so based on what units you're doing with them that's a very important important thing to be able to, um, you know, give them maybe some parameters. You can have them just kind of free draw with the dots, but you can also um, make it a little more restricted and um, link it to a specific theme that you're working on in class too. Maybe it's animals that day, or it could be something else that you're, that you're doing uh, with science or anything. But uh, yes, most definitely. And it's great because it's a pack of index cards and um, I go for the colorful dots. You can even use it with um, like sticky face, if you, uh, smiley face stickers too. So be creative and, and use what you have that's a great question and the other question was about um the the paper straw the straw rocket ships 
Um, I'm going to bring that slide up again because I believe um, there is a link at the bottom. It's nasa.com has amazing things. On Thursday, if you sign up with um, NASA has a, a, here it is well at the bottom, on the bottom right, it's that tiny little uh, nasa.gov slash exploration slash systems slash SLS slash index dot HTML. <laughs> um, if you wanna take a picture of that or if it's too much to write down, I can send you this presentation as well. Just drop me an email. Um, many of the things that are involved, if you can um, get on their mailing list, um, every Thursday, there's um, Steam Space stuff that's sent out to me. So uh, Dana, if you can, um, can you uh, provide us that email one more time and I'll drop also that in the chat. Um, Absolutely. Well. Sure. Um, let me get to the end. Sorry. <laughs> it's uh, Dana Mason 18 at gmail.com. So you can see it at the end here too, under my name. Uh, Dana Mason 18 at gmail. Okay, and so another question um, that was in the chat was, um, are some of the tools that you're mentioning and some of the resources that you've provided, are they just for students or are they for teachers as well in terms of um, helping them learn? You know, that's a great question because I think it goes beyond the actual resource itself. Um, absolutely, students and teachers can learn from these. Um, it just depends, I think, on how vulnerable and how flexible you want to be. We don't all know everything. We're all in this to continue learning and, and helping each other. So as if you're using this with adult education, everyone can break down a little bit and just have some fun and, and relive their childhood on this. Um, and just some great times. I mean, I remember doing fun things with friends like crafting and science stuff and all kinds of different things in class. Um, I was involved in a lot of art. I was involved in a lot of science, which is probably why these two backgrounds kind of interest me. But um, I can definitely see um, when I've done this in, with adult PD, all of these resources are very helpful. And I kind of think the only time it becomes an age issue is with some of the middle school and high school kids. They're gonna think something is too below, below them or too much for younger kids, or maybe it is too advanced. But for adults, I think they can kind of put themselves in the shoes to use these things. When I'm um, referring to stuff like um, Steam, I'm um, sorry, um, Civil Air Patrol, they have so many different resources that they offer each year. So um, many of them are for specific grade levels, um, but adults can play around and have a good time with them too. But mostly those I would say are for, um, for elementary school and maybe middle school. Okay. Well, you know, Dana, um, you're being thanked for the presentation. That was great. Um, we provided Dana's email in the chat for anybody that's interested in ascertaining her slide deck. Um, and you would get the slide deck and then we would ask, um, according to Dana, if you could please help her fill out the survey uh, because she's interested in providing more targeted uh, professional development and webinar series information for you if you're interested. So this has been wonderful, Dana. Thank you so much and we appreciate it. And we're very happy to have you here presenting your information um, with your breadth of experience for the webinar series for the Department of Educational Technology. And the uh, video, again, will be made available asynchronously online. And if you're joining us um, asynchronously online, you can please uh, make sure that you uh, send Dana a message um, if you uh, have gotten the video um, and that you are happy to have some of these resources sent to you. She's more than welcome to uh, send, willing to send those to you. So thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Thank and you, everybody. We hope to see you um, for another webinar series from the Department of Educational Technology.